Did you know you are physically adapting to all your swiping, scrolling, and tapping? We're changing our bodies and what they're able to do through our habits. NPR's Body Electric, a special interactive series investigating how to fix the relationship between our tech and our health. Listen in the TED Radio Hour feed wherever you get your podcasts. After months of stalemate, are the Texas House and Senate finally making progress on school spending? Find out today on the Texas Standard. Texas Standard is a production of KUT Austin, KERA North Texas, Houston Public Media, and Texas Public Radio in San Antonio. I'm Michael Marks. The legislature's two chambers have not been on the same page when it comes to school vouchers, but that could be changing. And for millions of years, the bones of a tiny dinosaur lay undisturbed in what are now the shores of Lake Grapevine. What is it? We'll describe a new species. Plus, are city parks set to decline? A new law could make it tougher for urban areas to procure parkland. All that and the latest headlines from around the state coming up on the Texas Standard right after this. It's Monday, November 13th, 2023, and no matter where you are, it's Texas Standard Time. I'm Michael Marks. A weekend of whiplash at Texas A&M on Saturday. The Aggie football team hung half a hundred on Mississippi State. Final score 51 to 10. On Sunday, A&M Athletic Director Ross Bjork announced that he'd fired the Aggies head football coach, Jimbo Fisher. Fisher still had several years left on his contract, so over the next eight years, Texas A&M will pay him $77 million not to coach, plus the cost of buying out Fisher's staff, plus the cost of hiring a new coach and a new staff. Fisher's buyout is the biggest ever for a college football coach. His arrival in 2017 was much heralded. This is the Aggie band playing on the tarmac next to the school's private jet as Fisher arrived for his introduction. At that introduction, a and Chancellor John Sharp gave Fisher a national championship plaque with a blank date to be filled in when the Ags won a title. The mediocre results on the field soured school officials on their big investment. We'll have more on the developments coming up in the news roundup, but the decision to pay Fisher a fortune to go home comes as the state legislature is also making some school spending decisions, specifically how to distribute taxpayer dollars to support education in Texas. This is the fourth special session called by Governor Greg Abbott, as the two chambers have so far failed to agree on a bill on school vouchers. But that could be changing. For more, we are now joined by Sergio Martinez Beltran, who covers state politics and government for the Texas Newsroom. Welcome back. Good to see you, Michael. So Governor Abbott has insisted that the legislature pass a bill that would allow students to spend public dollars on education expenses, including private school tuition, uh, education savings account or vouchers are the terms here. Let's start with the Senate's version of the bill, which passed relatively quickly. Can you just... Remind us what's in what's in this one uh, as opposed to previous iterations. Yes. So the Senate version of this proposal that you're talking about is Senate Bill 1, and it's just a school voucher bill. So it only includes funding for the creation of an education savings account program, which is a voucher-like program that pretty much creates a savings account for parents to use uh, to pay for the tuition of private or parochial schools. They could also use that money to pay for tutors, to pay for uniforms, transportation, anything school-related. But again, that bill from the Senate only includes a school voucher program. Uh, Qualifying students, which truly, it's it's pretty broad. Uh, We know there's some prioritization for uh, students who are low income, for students who uh, have special needs. But besides that, you know, any student who qualifies for this program would get about $8,000 to pay for for these uh, expenses. And that's what what the Senate passed uh, last week, which is very similar to what they passed during the third legislative session, (laughs) a special session, and similar to what they passed during the regular session. Okay, the the news here, though, is that the House, which has been sort of the the sticking point in these negotiations, I think it's fair to say, uh, last week, late last week, they came forth with uh, a bill of their own. What does that look like? Yes, it's an omnibus education bill. So it's it's a huge bill, House Bill 1. And it includes funding for the creation of 
education savings accounts or school vouchers, but it also includes money for school safety and money uh, to increase the basic allotment, which is the state's per pupil funding. And, and that's interesting, right? Because again, the Senate is, is, is taking this, these bills one by one, but the House put everything together in one big bill. The House um, version includes $10,500 for parents to use to pay for private school tuition of students and that's what ad- what's advancing in the house and last week's um, vote michael was big because the house has not voted on an education savings account bill uh this this year it has stalled in committee or you know it has never gotten yeah. to this point so this represents real progress this is not just kind of uh the tokenism where we're you know we're getting back to the starting point uh, this is a real move forward it is, it is. And now, we are not sure whether those holdouts, particularly Republican holdouts, if they're going to flip with this bill. We have heard some Republican lawmakers who in the past have opposed school vouchers in the House who are now maybe considering voting on this bill because of all the other components like salary raises for teachers and, and increasing the basic allotment. So they are saying, hey, maybe this is the bill we have to swallow because it has this really good things as well but we still don't know though and and you know there's always the possibility that when this bill hits the house floor for a vote lawmakers will try to amend the bill and strip the education savings account provision out of it do we have any clues as to how uh folks in the senate you know specifically lieutenant governor dan patrick feel about some of these additional provisions that are included in in the house bill Yes, I, I talked to uh, Senator Brandon Creighton, who is the author carrying this this version in the Senate, and he told us that you know he thinks that what the House is doing is good. He says that there's really a, you know really good components in the House's bill, but that there has to be a conversation between both chambers for anything to move forward. One of the reasons why the Senate is not including salary raises and everything else in their version of the bill is because Senator Creighton says that they sent a version like that at some point and the Mm. House members rejected it. So he's like, we're sticking to the $8,000, just a voucher bill, and then the House will have to come through and we'll have a conversation about it. What is going to come next in this process? What can we look forward to this week? We're expecting the House to schedule a floor vote on House Bill 1 sometime this week. We are expecting that vote to take hours. You know, there's probably going to be a lot of amendments. There's probably going to be a a robust debate. And then we're going to see, I think, uh, again, it's going to be interesting to see whether the Republicans who represent rural areas who have been the ones who have historically opposed this bill, whether they're going to flip now. What happens, though, if these negotiations end up breaking down? Well, it sounds like we're going to be called back for a special session, (laughs) a new one. Governor Abbott has said that, uh, you know, in the past he said that he's going to keep calling special sessions and that at one point he's just going to get involved in the primaries of those Republicans who oppose school vouchers. But last week he said that he'll call them back in December and January and February if needed, and then he'll get involved in the politicking of all of it. So lawmakers can probably expect to come back to Austin if they don't pass something. Sergio Martinez Beltran covers state politics for the Texas Newsroom. Thanks again for chatting with us, Sergio. You're welcome. El Paso residents are concerned about the growing number of high-speed chases in their city. They involve state troopers trying to catch suspected smugglers. The chases often top 100 miles an hour and have resulted in multiple crashes and deaths. Bystanders are also injured. KTEP's Angela Kacherga was at a meeting organized by DPS where El Pasoans said the chases are putting their lives at risk. Yes, well, the platform plus what is it that they use? Like, Residents you know? filled the town hall to learn about smuggling in far west El Paso, including tips for spotting a stash house. But they also had questions, especially about the DPS policy for pursuing suspected smugglers. Almost exclusively, the drivers of these vehicles are young people, U.S. citizens, not over the age of 25. Eduardo Solis asked why not follow the Border Patrol's example and track vehicles from a distance. And they get to the stash house. And guess what? They're not chasing a vehicle that's got five or six people in it. They get to the stash house, it's got 40 individuals in it. Most law enforcement agencies in El Paso, including police, 
only pursue a suspect engaged in a violent crime who poses an imminent threat to the public. Dian Dorado retired last year after decades in law enforcement. He and a friend had a close call during one of the high-speed DPS chases. In comes the suspect. And here comes the trooper right behind him. And if we hadn't jumped out of the way, we would have been run over. Dorado is especially concerned about what's known as a pit maneuver. That's when the trooper hits a fleeing vehicle in an attempt to get it to stop, causing it to roll over. Their chase policy is wrong, and they need to change that so it secures the safety of all the citizens. Plus, you don't want to sentence a kid to death by doing a pit maneuver on him. DPS Regional Director Joe Sanchez told people at the town hall, while the individual trooper decides whether to pursue a suspect. I just want to assure you and everybody else that when we do have things, there's a review process. He said body and dash cam video is reviewed by supervisors if there's a question after a chase. Following the town hall meeting, I asked him how they decide when to pursue a vehicle. We chase what we can chase to do it safely and properly. Uh, if we feel that we're, we're going to endanger too many people from doing it, then we're going to back off. There is a tool that may lead more troopers to back off. DPS is training them to use a tracking device. It's a tracker that deploys it. Once you get close enough to the vehicle, you can shoot the tracker out and it has a magnet where it sticks to the bumper, and then from there we can back off and track the vehicle. Sanchez said the equipment is expensive, so most troopers in El Paso do not have trackers. If more get them, it might prevent some of the high-speed chases here that have resulted in injuries and deaths on El Paso roadways. I'm Angela Cocherga in El Paso. For the first time this week, time to check in with social media editor Wells Dunbar. Hey, Wells. Michael Marks, good to be with you this Monday. And it's great to hear from all these folks sharing their thoughts on topics we've been exploring today, specifically that story at the top of the show, the prospects for school voucher legislation here on the fourth special legislative uh -huh. session. Huh. Yep, on our Facebook page, Sean Lowry says, if the people of Texas wanted private school funding, Abbott would not be on his fourth forced session and having to blackmail us over the funding of what we really care about the wholly inadequate underfunding of our public schools. Meanwhile, John Streeb decries Abbott's total disrespect, in his words, for individual elected representatives to vote independently without the threat of political repercussions. And Rick Schultz asks if Abbott will continue to do this until he gets what he wants and asks what's next, threatening to hold his breath until he turns blue. Interesting strategy there. Uh, one that we will not likely see, though, I suspect, Michael. Probably Other not. folks chiming in <laughs> No, probably not. Other folks chiming in about the weather this frosty Monday in many parts of the state. Deborah Norowski saying it's cold and rainy, but I'm not complaining. And besides, who, what, what good would it do for folks to complain anyway, Michael? I'll be back with more reactions from social media later in the show. What are you talking or maybe even complaining about Texas? Wells wants to know. Find us on your social media channel of choice. Support for Texas Standard comes from Texas Center for Proton Therapy, offering precision proton radiation treatment for many types of cancer. More at texasprotons.com. This is the Texas Standard. I'm Michael Marks. An Austin police officer named Christopher Taylor is at the center of a murder trial in Central Texas. This week, the jury could reach a verdict as to whether Taylor ignored best practices and wrongly shot and killed Mike Ramos in 2020. KUT's Andrew Weber tells us that so far, jurors have been deadlocked. This is the third day of deliberation for jurors. They must unanimously decide whether Taylor acted reasonably when he shot Ramos three times at a Southeast Austin apartment complex in April 2020. Ramos was fleeing, but Taylor's attorneys say he feared Ramos could have threatened the lives of responding officers, and his actions were justified. The six officers who responded to the 911 call testified in court. And, if convicted, Taylor would be the second police officer convicted of murder in an on-duty shooting in Texas in nearly half a century. I'm Andrew Weber in Austin. Andrew has been following this trial for weeks. We'll check in with him when jurors reach a verdict.
Support for coverage of business comes from Texas Mutual, a workers' compensation insurance company committed to providing support to nonprofits, bringing positive change to working families and Texas communities. More at texasmutual.com slash community. And you're listening to the Texas Standard. Americans have responded passionately to the war between Israel and Hamas, pressuring politicians and protesting the actions of both sides. Some of the most outspoken supporters of Israel are found in churches like Pastor John Hagee's. Hagee leads Cornerstone Church, a megachurch in San Antonio with more than 10,000 members, and he's a leader in a pro-Israel movement known as Christian Zionism. Texas Monthly staff writer Josh Alvarez recently wrote about Hagee and how he harnesses political power in support of the Jewish state. Josh, welcome to the Texas Standard. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Uh, before we get into Hagee specifically and what you observed uh, at the service that you went to in support of Israel, uh, can you tell us about Christian Zionism as as a concept? What are what are its goals and, and what do its supporters, uh, what are sort of their, the, the main tenets of their beliefs? Sure. Uh, Christian Zionism has a deep history that actually goes back um, even to the 1800s, if, if not even earlier. The general idea is that um, these are Christians, and it's not all Christians, this is a particular um, thread within Christianity that believes that Jews are the chosen people um, and that the uh, covenant that they made with God in, in Genesis um, still holds um, today, uh, that the Jews have a particular uh, claim to uh, their biblical land um, of, of Israel, um, as outlined in the Bible and in the, in the Old Testament. So, you know, within Christian Zionism, there's there's different kinds of threads of, of, uh, of interpretation, of, of, of but the general gist of it is that um, the resettlement of, of the ancient kingdom of Israel is, is an essential um, component of to create the conditions for the return of Jesus, um, for, mm. for his return, and, and then for the beginning of the end times. So, uh, in, in that regard, um, Christian Zionism, you know, Zionists broadly agree on that. To the extent to what happens with the end times is, is where things vary. And, uh, as I wrote in my piece, the most extreme, um, you know, Christian Zionists believe that uh, once uh, Jews reclaim this land of theirs, that Jesus will return and then you know, right thinking Christians and uh, therefore Jews who repent um, and then convert to Christianity uh, will be uh, raptured to heaven and and uh, leave everybody else to um, uh, suffer the wrath of Armageddon. In Pastor Haggy's interpretation, he's a little, he's less extreme in that he holds that since uh, Jews, Jews are chosen um, and that's permanent, that there's, in other words, there's always going to be a place in the kingdom of heaven for for Jews, that there's no, um, you know, conversion uh, required. Got it. To what extent has Pastor Hagee uh, been the leader of this movement, or a leader? He he started this. Uh, it's called a Night to Honor Israel. It's this, and this was the event that I attended. Um, he he started it 43 years ago. It it, it started off small, but uh, this sort of uh, interpret this theological interpretation that Hagee, um, you know, was was offering um, picked up a great big bit of steam uh, within a few decades. And, and really that the, the popularity of this event, this Night to Honor Israel, which is not really a church service, it's, it's almost a kind of an affirmation um, of the, a Christian evangelical affirmation of, you know, supporting Israel with this theology in mind of um, that to support Israel is to, is to be, um, you know, performing a holy duty. Um, the popularity of that event is actually what led to the creation of uh, this lobby organization um, called Christians United for Israel, which appears to be the, the most powerful pro-Israel lobby in the United States, and po- quite possibly one of the biggest lobbies in the country with, um, as, as Pastor Hagee says, um, a membership uh, exceeding 10 million uh, Americans, uh, which is which quite significant. So sure. um, this has led him to become, uh, I describe him as, as a, a Republican keenmaker of sorts, and, and Republicans are paying attention. Quite prominent figures in the party have been appearing at these events um, and at, at Kufi, um, you know, Christian United for Israel uh, events through over the years. Uh, you know, and, it, and Israeli politicians, for that matter, are aware of the power of this organization as well. 
you know, Benjamin Netanyahu himself uh, gave a taped address uh, to the 2019 uh, Kufi summit held in Washington, D.C. And in this year's Night to Honor Israel event, you know, you had two Israeli diplomats, including the uh, permanent representative to the United Nations, uh, Gilad Erdan. If you don't mind, can you describe uh, what the Night to Honor Israel uh, was like, the one that you attended recently? Sure. Uh, and I just want to clarify, too, that, you know, this event started in San Antonio, but they're now these events are now held all around the country across many, many evangelical churches host them. Um, they are organized and sponsored by uh, Kufi. But uh, but the originator, the progenitor of all of them is was held here in San Antonio and, and with Pastor Haggy. So I, I went to uh, this year's event and it's usually held in late October. Um, and it, so it just so happened the timing of it you know, it was such that it was, it was held just shortly after the October 7th um, pogrom uh, uh, perpetrated by Hamas. So typically these events, again, are just pretty straightforward um, reaffirmations uh, of, of the, this evangelical movement's commitment to Israel. But this time um, it of course carried a, an enormous emotional weight of what had just happened. And so the, you know, the mood was, was much different um, in that regard. And, uh, uh, you know, the speakers really just focused on the necessity of maximal support for Israel in its war uh, against Hamas. And this is where the, uh, uh, the, the political goals and the theological goals of Christian Zionists, um, you know, enter into a, a fraught place because uh, it's, this is obviously a complicated you know, issue, which, you know, not only involves a war against a militant group, but because of Gaza and the way that um, it's it's so tightly populated, it's two million people in a very small space. Uh, there's obvious you know concerns around Palestinian civilians and and their fate. But in in this event, it was rather remarkable, and and I, I couldn't help but note that uh, this was something that was not really given much consideration. It was it was the the focus was really you know that the U.S. must provide any and all means um, for Israel to do whatever it has to do um, in order to achieve victory uh, through whatever means necessary. Josh Alvarez is a staff writer for Texas Monthly. We'll have a link to his latest reporting over at TexasStandard.org. Josh, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. From the Texas Newsroom, I'm Matt Thomas. An estimated 10,000 people showed up at the state capitol in Austin yesterday to show support for Palestinians impacted by the war with Israel. KUT's Haya Panjwani has details. Abe, Abe, what do you say? How many kids have you killed today? The demonstrators showed up carrying Palestinian flags and signs. A plane circled overhead, pulling a banner that said, Save Palestine, Cease Fire Now. And the crowd passed a scroll with the names of people who have been killed in Gaza. Mohammed Nabolsi with the Palestinian Youth Movement said they wanted to deliver a message to the state legislature and Governor Greg Abbott. Communities across the state of Texas are here to demand that the state government and the governor and this entire country as a whole call for a ceasefire and a call for an end to the genocide of our people. Governor Abbott traveled to Israel earlier this month and has expressed his, quote, unwavering support, end quote, for the country. I'm Haya Panjwani in Austin. Members of an all-black army battalion are receiving clemency for their part in a 1917 riot. Texas Public Radio's Jerry Clayton has the story. The U.S. Army today is announcing clemency for 110 soldiers of the all-black 3rd Battalion, U.S. 24th Infantry Regiment, and will change their records to reflect that they served honorably. 19 of the 110 soldiers were convicted of mutiny for their role in the 1917 Houston riot and hanged at Fort Sam Houston. The remainder were court-martialed. The move by the Army restores the soldiers' individual rights and privileges, including properties lost and could make their descendants eligible for some benefits. The announcement is being made at the Buffalo Soldiers National Museum in Houston. I'm Jerry Clayton in San Antonio. 
Texas A&M University has fired head football coach Jimbo Fisher in the middle of this season. Texas Public Radio's Dan Katz reports his $77.5 million contract buyout is the highest in college football history. Texas A&M's athletic director Ross Bjork called the buyout monumental and something that will have consequences but said that it had to be done because the team has been underperforming despite its elite fundraising, recruiting, and facilities. Our program is stuck in neutral. We should be relevant on the national scene. Something is not clicking. Bjork says no public dollars will go towards Fisher's buyout. The money will come from unrestricted donations and the school's athletic department. The Jimbo Fisher buyout more than triples the previous record. That would be Auburn's $21.7 million buyout of Gus Malzahn in 2020. I'm Dan Katz reporting. I'm Matt Thomas from the Texas Newsroom. Support for these Texas headlines comes from Texas Mutual, a workers' compensation insurance company committed to providing support to nonprofits, bringing positive change to working families and Texas communities. More at texasmutual.com slash community. It's the Texas Standard. I'm Michael Marks. And I'm David Brown. A few years ago, paleontologists in the Dallas area made a remarkable discovery. The fossilized jawbone of a tiny, previously unidentified dinosaur. Its features made it an unusual find for the area, and now, after years of further study, researchers have published their findings on the new species in the Journal of Vertebrate Paleontology. Here to tell us more about the dino is Dr. Ron Tykoski. He is vice president of science and curator of vertebrate paleontology at the Perot Museum. Dr. Ron, welcome to the Texas Standard. Thanks for having me on. First, what did you name this dinosaur, and could you tell us a little bit about uh, the origins of this name? Sure. The, we named it Ampelognathus coeni, and the name there breaks down. It comes down from ancient Greek ampelos for grapes or grapevines, and nathos, meaning jaw, and coeni after the gentleman who actually found the fossil. So the name roughly translates out to Cohen's grapevine jaw. Cohen's grapevine jaw, indicating, I guess, uh, uh, where uh, the dino was discovered or the jaw was discovered. Who's Cohen? Yep, uh, Cohen is the fellow who found it. He's a volunteer who uh, also a fossil hunting enthusiast who likes to go on out to this particular exposure and uh, spends his, his free time looking for fossils. When he finds them, he brings them to us here at the Pro Museum, and then we do the science on it. Well, now that's amazing. So tell us how your team first came across this fossil. What was it like? Well, he actually found this and sent pictures from when he was out on the exposure saying, hey, I think I found a little crocodile jaw. <laughs> and I uh, took a look at the dirty, you know, still covered in mud and dirt and, and, and junk on there and took a look at it. And you could see tooth sockets, and we'd found bits and pieces of little crocs out there before. I said, yeah, you probably did. Bring it on in. And so it wasn't until we were back in the lab, and I was working on it under a microscope, cleaning it off with literally with needles under a scope. And Kind of, okay, probably a little croc, probably a little croc. And then suddenly I started finding anatomical features on it that said, this is not a croc. This is something new. And then, <laughs> boom. Lo and behold, I found a particular feature on there that is only present in plant-eating dinosaurs. And so immediately I knew I had to shift, shift the mental gears and uh, go in a different direction. Is it clear what kind of plants this, uh, this creature mm-hmm. ate? Or uh, uh, was, it, was it also, I presume, uh, being consumed by larger uh, dinosaurs? Yes, it probably spent most of its life trying to not be eaten by bigger things, other things. But yeah, as a matter of fact, from the, from the very same deposits, the same exposures where we found the jaw, it turns out our paleobotanist here at the Perot has discovered a huge number of fossil plants, many of which will turn out to be new to science as well. She's still working on those. So we have the plant eater and we have the plants it was eating in the same time in the very same place. How small are we talking about here? This is a this is a little animal. Uh, you know, the the partial jaw that we have is about two inches long. The whole head would have you could have fit it in the palm of your hand. It was probably six inches long, maybe give or take a little bit. The, you know, the whole animal it's a lot of tail and a lot of neck, but I would guess it probably no heavier than a standard schnauzer or a golden retriever or something like that. Probably would have been about six feet long, but would have, you know it, it could stand on your desk, you know, where you're sitting right now. Probably a foot and a half tall at the hips at most, so just a little bitty guy running around. You know, you you, you mentioned about the size of a dog. I, I guess a lot of folks would wonder, you sure this isn't something else? <laughs> yeah. Oh, absolutely. You know, that's how science works. Uh, we worked for probably a year working on this thing to try to prove our idea wrong. That's how science works. Science doesn't work by proving things. Scientific method works by disproving ideas. So our idea was, our hypothesis is, is this something new? Well, we worked really hard to show that it's not. 
And only after doing that for about, oh, no, it's not this, it's not a croc, it's not this kind of animal, it's not that kind of animal, it doesn't match anything else, so maybe it's this. After ruling all those things out and failing to disprove the idea, only then did we go forward and go, you know what, we probably have something new here. Hmm. Let's go down that avenue of thought. And then eventually we decided to chance it and put a name on it. And some reviewers at the journal uh, agreed with us. At least they didn't they didn't flush it down the drain. <laughs> so so tell us about what you consider to be the significance of this discovery. And by the way, will this be on display at the museum? We probably aren't going to have this out on display anytime soon. But one, it's really pretty scungy looking. <laughs> it's mm-hmm. it's kind of unimpressive from a from a layperson's perspective. It has scientific uh, information and value, but. It's kind of ugly, but who knows? Maybe sometime down the road, maybe we incorporate it into something um, greater to tell the story about life in North Texas. But that is the story. That is the contribution to this thing. This is from a time and a place with a very poor prehistoric record, you know, 96 million years in age, in a part of North America that was east of a seaway that once split the continent in two. And that eastern side of of that seaway has a terrible fossil record of terrestrial life. And so every little thing we're finding here is actually a new contribution to painting a better picture of what life was like in this half of North America at the time, which then, of course, helps us figure out different patterns of how things evolved and how ecosystems changed for the next few millions of years leading up to the big extinction event that occurred 66 million years ago. Dr. Ron Tykoski is vice president of science and curator of vertebrate paleontology at the Perot Museum. Dr. Tykoski, thanks so much for your time. Thank you for having me on. It's the Texas Standard. I'm Michael Marks. San Antonio's history is nothing if not unusual. One of its most curious periods is the 60 years when the Chili Queens fed the city in open-air plazas. Texas Public Radio's Jack Morgan looks back at the Chili Queens era. The Chili Queens' reign ran from about 1870 till 1930. They cooked and served in open-air markets set in downtown plazas. And their day started early, probably sometime around 4 a.m. I can imagine these women waking up early in the morning. Liliana Saldana is Associate Professor of Mexican-American Studies at UTSA. Grinding the corn, making the tortillas. I imagine the smell of the chiles, right? The smell of these home-cooked meals, conversations and platicas and people just coming in and out of the plazas. The Chili Queens ruled no kingdoms, but for about 60 years, they played a critical role downtown. Historian Louis Fisher reminds us that San Antonio was a frontier city, and the primary way to get anywhere was by walking or on horse-drawn wagons. All the, uh, the wagon drivers and the cowboys and others who came through needed something to eat. And so the families, uh, people there, uh, got some fast food together, which in those days was uh, not just chili, but also enchiladas and tamales and and menudo, all all kinds of food. Although the Queens worked in several plazas, Military Plaza was one of the primary ones. That one is now dominated by the old City Hall building. But before City Hall was there, it was basically a, a large open square. Many of the Chili Queens lived just blocks west from there in what was called Laredito, or Little Laredo. Graciela Sanchez is director of the Esperanza Peace and Justice Center. And you have all these fruit and vegetable farmers that are coming to town and selling all their wares, and they get hungry. And so this is where the women come in and set up shop, and they do it from early morning to late night. Necessity is the mother of invention, and these women and their families invented a way to fill San Antonians' stomachs and make a living doing so. The women are definitely the cooks, but it's a family affair. So you have men coming into the market area, be it the Plaza del Zacate or Military Plaza or Alamo Plaza, and they're coming in with their horse-drawn wagons, and within those horse-drawn wagons, they're pulling out all the different pots of food that they're coming to sell later on. They're also bringing the wood that they're going to use to continue to warm up the foods that are there. In a sense, the Chili Queens were, to their era, what food trucks are now. 
Saldana says just getting to the plaza was a huge effort. To transport all these big cazuelas or pots of maybe pre-made food, also, you know, the plates, the utensils, the wood to heat up the food in the plazas, uh, the tables, the chairs, the tent. This is enormous labor. These are like pop-up restaurants, but they were there every single day. Those who were able to thrive made enough money to help their families move in the right direction. And it also gave them a sense of pride. You know, I think there's a level of also autonomy. These were women who were able to create a business from their food. Graciela Sanchez's great-grandmother was a chili queen, and she did quite well. My great-grandmother lived in this area from the 1890s till the 1921 flood. And then by this time, she had already saved some money and already had a home on Chihuahua Street in the historic or near west side. With hundreds of people gathering in plazas for their meals, Sanchez said it attracted people whose presence fanned the flames of culture. The musicians, the singers, the Lidia Mendozas, all the trios that we still see today at uh, Mi Tierra, they were the walking musicians that went from one stall to the other and also tried to make their three cents, five cents per song, per stall. So it was just, a, I think, a really exciting time as well. Lewis Fisher notes that the plazas where the chili queens cooked was something of a sociology experiment. There was a lot of uh, socialization going on down there. There were the no economic barriers. You could have a well-dressed banker next to a, uh, a street worker, all uh, standing in line for the same, uh, the same food. It was very egalitarian. Hundreds of people from all walks of life coming together also creates something unintended. Saldana said it was a place for interchange between San Antonians from all walks of life. I imagine the plazas being spaces of political discourse at a time when Spanish-speaking Mexican-Americans didn't have access to English language media. So they're listening to what's going on in the community through corridos, right, through music. Graciela Sanchez says this was still an era when most common people couldn't read or write their language. And so that space became a place where the politicians went and debated what the topics of the day were. There were individuals who were literate, and they would pick up a newspaper, probably in Spanish language, and they read to the community, especially for folks who couldn't read. And so they were learning what was happening in the U.S. and Mexico and in San Antonio. She says that these plazas served another humanist function. We also know that if people wanted to write, there was an escribano, right? So somebody that sat in the corner or two or three or four of them, right, writing on behalf of someone. It's like, I want to send a letter to my mother who's in Mexico, but I don't know how to write. So that person would write for them and they would send off those letters. So it was holistic. Everything you needed and wanted, you could probably find within this area. Fisher says there was one event that turned the Chili Queens into an attribute known by people nationwide. The railroad got here in 1877. Travel writers would come to uh, San Antonio and then in the magazines, uh, news magazines at the time, uh, they would have a prominent uh, place in the uh, stories of uh, this exotic city. San Antonio's reputation as a place like none other was surely enhanced by articles and photos of the like-nowhere-else city, but Fisher says there was trouble on the horizon. As people became more aware of germs in the latter 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, uh, sanitation began to uh, be an issue. Sanchez says they were victims of their own success. I think they were so successful that that also became their downfall, right? So you then start having indoor restaurants, and those restaurant owners are complaining because the businesswomen outside don't have to pay rent or have that sort of overhead. And so suddenly there's pressure by these restaurant owners that are indoors who start complaining to the health department. New rules involving inspections and health certificates led to more difficult hoops to jump through. They really did try their absolute best to resist some of these policies, but eventually they were banned. 
Sanchez says this history speaks to the work ethic these chili queens had. We can be joyful about a history of memory, but these folks did struggle. I mean, they were making pennies on those meals or those songs. By the 1930s, the Chili Queens had been driven from the downtown plazas, but rather than having simply disappeared, their grit, creativity, and determination has been passed on to many of those who create Tex-Mex food now in hundreds of family restaurants around the city. I'm Jack Morgan in San Antonio. For more on the Texas Chili Queens, head on over to texasstandard.org. Got some great archival photographs there. While there, you can also sign up for the Talk of Texas. It's the weekly newsletter from the Texas Standard, and it's free. It's another great way to keep up with news from across the state. That's at texasstandard.org. More news coming up, including a look at a new law that could curb Texas City's ability to create and improve public parks. Support for Texas Standard comes from Enel North America, generating renewable energy with projects run by and for Texans, investing in the future of local communities, schools, and small businesses. Learn more at enelnorthamerica.com slash Texas. This is the Texas Standard. I'm Michael Marks. Studies have shown that there are positive health outcomes for folks living in cities linked to the amount of park and greenery space available. But the effects of a new law could hinder cities' ability to procure new parkland. For more, we're talking with KUT City Hall reporter Luz Moreno Lozano. Luz, welcome back to the Texas Standard. Thanks for having me. So could you give us a refresher on this bill, HB 1526? What's it going to do? Yeah, so uh, HB 1526 came out of the latest legislative session. Um, It basically changes how cities can regulate parkland dedication. So and this is just cities with populations over 800,000 people. So big cities. Yeah. Austin, San Antonio, Houston, Dallas. Uh, But basically when a developer comes in, the city usually requires them to dedicate a certain amount of parkland. Um, or they can pay a fee in lieu. And so what this law does is change what that acreage has to be when they're coming in. It used to be, you know, the cities could control how much land they could dedicate. And now the state legislator is like, you can only dedicate this much now. Understood. So this this seems like another local control issue, right? Yeah. So this is just another bill that came out of the legislative session that is now imposed on local entities like Austin and Houston and Dallas. And so in some cases, it prevents these cities from achieving their specific goals. In this case, it's around accessibility to parks and green spaces. Wow. Okay. So Austin specifically, uh, you report, has some pretty progressive parkland dedication rules. And now They'll have to scale back. How so? Yeah. So Austin had rules in place that required developers to give like 9.4 acres of parkland per 1,000 residents. Uh, And then last year they added commercial developers, you know, people who come downtown and can dedicate parklands. And they were using that to close in gaps on on green belts, you know, like Shoal Creek. Like those green belts go like from North Austin all the way to downtown Austin. Um, And so what the legislator is asking them to do now is to only give between 0.075 and three acres of land per 1,000 residents. Okay. Depending on where it is in the city. You know, if if it's out in their outskirts, it can do three acres. If it's in closer to the city, it's much, 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 much. Um, Maybe three quarters of an acre. Yeah. Right, right. It's it's much smaller. Um, and the, the, the legislator is also asking them to kind of cut down the fees. So these fee in lieu, you know, the city was able to regulate that. Um, and Austin is expecting to lose between 40 and 70 percent of what is charged today. Does it have other options to make up that revenue? Has the city council brought that up or anything? They have not, but I talked to some folks about this. And one of the ways that the city can make up uh, how they can make up these fees is through bonds. So things that like impro- like impact your property taxes. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, Travis County just had a pretty big bond yeah. package that we all approved last week. Um, and so, you know, the city can go out for bonds. But instead of putting that burden on developers, developers when they come in and they bring in the growth with their new buildings and new projects. Mm -hmm. Now we're putting that back on the voters, back on people who have to now increase their property taxes in order to like have more space. Right. Individual taxpayers. Exactly. Exactly. 
Well, you you've spoke with uh, a number of folks around this issue, you know, policymakers, advocates. Uh, what are some of the uh, opinions you've heard about the effect of these new rules? I think mo- most of it is disappointing. I think people want to live near parks. I mean, everyone wants to be outside during the pandemic. I think we all yeah. learned like being outside is important. It gives <laughs> us like, you know, great time to be out, you know. Um, And so I think most people have found it pretty disappointing that we are not going to be able to do green spaces at the same rate that we have before. Um, But I do think that the park staff has looked at like, okay, we have to be a lot smarter about the money that we do have and how we're investing it around the city so that we are still meeting our goals of equality and accessibility across Austin. We've been speaking with Luz Moreno Lozano, City Hall reporter for our home station, KUT. Luz, thanks so much. Thanks for having me. And you're listening to the Texas Standard. Support for Texas Standard comes from Texas Mutual, a workers' compensation insurance company committed to providing support to nonprofits, bringing positive change to working families and Texas communities. More at TexasMutual.com slash community. Before we go, let's check in with social media editor Wells Dunbar, see if he's got a case of the Mondays. Hey, Wells. <laughs> Just a mild case so far. But you know, Michael, it is World Kindness Day, according to uh, Giselle Rackley oh. on her Facebook page. So I'll try and go a little easy on you. Um, <laughs> you know, have, I got a question for you, though. You've been following this Jimbo Fisher situation. A pretty wild stuff we heard about there in the news roundup halfway through the show. I, I have been following it. Uh, I find it remarkable. On remarkable is a good choice many of words, levels. Yes. $77 million payout for the Texas A&M football coach uh, to uh, part ways early there on the contract. Incredible. Um, and, and as we heard, it's it's not like a, a, a record of outright failure. I believe he's about, uh, what, like two to one uh, wins over losses during his time there, but obviously not what the university was looking for. Uh, an interesting tweet here from uh, Ross Dellinger, uh, I believe the Yahoo Sports reporter. He notes, is this the first time in college football history that two head coaches have been fired mid-season in the days following their game against one another? A&M beat Mississippi State 51-10 to on Saturday, and Jimbo Fisher was out on Sunday, uh-huh. Zach Arnett out on Monday. Uh, oh, the so, coach of Mississippi State also got fired. <laughs> so I guess maybe folks weren't taking this uh, World Kindness what Day stuff to heart. a cursed contest on Saturday. Holy yeah, smokes. for real. And, of course, uh, as you would imagine, many people uh, chiming in about the remarkable uh, financial financial uh, uh, decisions at stake here uh, on our Facebook page. Tyler Malloy says he's stunned at how much AM's athletic department and the 12th Man, Man Foundation – are going to be paying to not have a football coach $77 million sure would go a long way towards things that actually benefit the university and its students. As we heard there, yeah, the majority of that money coming from um, uh, this uh, booster money, essentially, uh, from supporters of the football program. But yeah, a lot of change, uh, a big chunk of change there, Michael, I think it's fair to say. Uh, Also hearing from folks about uh, another story we heard about there in the news roundup, uh, as uh, Texas Observer uh, reporter Gus Bova tweets, the largest protest at the Texas Capitol since the 2017 women's march that would be that uh, huge rally in uh, at the state capitol uh, in uh, favor of a ceasefire and, and the uh, people of Palestine yeah. uh, or Gaza rather uh, he says honestly I'm seeing some videos from higher up of the march makes me wonder if that 10k figure is still low but yes quite a turnout at the state capitol and these calls for a ceasefire reflecting some of the actions uh, or some of the statements we're seeing on our Facebook page, post, bleh, page as well there Mario Modesto says he's very concerned about what What's going on in Gaza, particularly the disproportionate bombardment of the civilian population. He says it's understandable that the Israeli military is seeking Hamas militants, but at the peril of the Palestinian population that is likely not responsible for these Hamas atrocities. Atrocities, uh, again, calling there for a ceasefire, um, uh, as uh, many uh, folks have here. Continuing to monitor the situation at the Capitol regarding this special session, as well, though, Karen Dickenstein has an interesting question here on our Facebook page. What happens if the legislators decide not to play Abbott's infinite game of special sessions by not showing up? I know, as Sergio told us, looks like another one might be in the cards after this one, then another one, then another one. So who can say, Michael? <laughs> who can say we will tomorrow 
and every day after that. The news never stops also at texasstandard.org. You can find us there. Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Philanthropic support for Texas Standard comes from Casey and Scott O'Hare, the Winkler Family Foundation, Lynn Dobson and Greg Woldridge, Adrian Killam, and the George Huntington family. You've been listening to the Texas Standard. Texas Standard and KUT Public Radio are members of the NPR Network. It's an independent coalition of public media podcasters. You can find a lot more great content and shows like the Texas Standard in the NPR Network, available wherever you listen to podcasts. Did you know you are physically adapting to all your swiping, scrolling, and tapping? We're changing our bodies and what they're able to do through our habits. NPR's Body Electric, a special interactive series investigating how to fix the relationship between our tech and our health. Listen in the TED Radio Hour feed wherever you get your podcasts.